Okay, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks to all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. We have uh, over 260 folks uh, registered for this afternoon. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is the first of two Glasgow uh, in the COVID-19 world uh, events. Uh, my name is Stuart Patrick and I am the Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and I am your host for this afternoon. Um, as I say, this is the first of two events in partnership with our colleagues at uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, we will return in the spring to uh, review where we have reached, uh, perhaps uh, we hope in a, a somewhat brighter mood than uh, we might be in right now as we're heading into the depths of winter. But so today we are coming together to discuss where the economy of the Glasgow city region is right now, uh, the effects of the virus, and some key asks of policymakers as we head deeper uh, into the winter, uh, handling the second wave as we now are. To introduce uh, our session, I'm delighted to ask uh, Malcolm Buchanan, who's chairman of Royal Bank of Scotland's Scotland Board and MD of Corporate and Commercial Banking uh, for Scotland, to say a few words. Over to you, Malcolm. Thanks, Stuart, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You know, I have to say, eight months into COVID, I am still shocked by you know, the pace at which this has happened and the extent of the damage. It's quite shocking. But it's not over yet, and I don't think there's ever been a time when it's been so important for us to be really well connected. So I'm really delighted that the Royal Bank of Scotland is collaborating with the Chamber on this event today. And in a few minutes, I'll hand back to Stuart. But before I do that, I just wanted to say a very few words about the bank's response to the COVID crisis. <clears throat> I mean, we have for the last six months been flat out providing support to our customers in Scotland, in fact, around the whole of the UK. And just to give you a sense of the scale of that, I don't want to throw too many uh, stats at you, but we've provided in excess of 70,000 capital repayment holidays on over 10 billion of pre-COVID debt to non-personal customers across the whole bank. And on government scheme loans, we've provided in excess of 13 billion of bounce back loans for almost 300,000 customers across the whole of the UK. So that actually makes us the biggest supporter of government scheme lending across the whole of the country. But it's not just businesses that we've helped. We've also supported in excess of 250,000 households across the UK with mortgage repayment holidays. And also developed a range of ways to help vulnerable customers or those customers that were shielding to do their personal banking, including delivering cash to their homes and also companion cards for families and carers. But in, in terms of other support for the wider community, our colleagues and customers have been working really hard throughout Scotland to get support to those people that need it. We raised 10, billion pounds, sorry, 10 million pounds for the National Emergencies Trust. And we also repurposed our Dogerburn Conference Centre almost overnight um, into a food bank distribution centre, working with the Trussell Trust and Social Bite to help as many families struggling with the impact of COVID. So the COVID crisis has been an enormous challenge for everyone. Uh, and having been through the 2008 financial crisis, it feels very different to me in my view. And in fact, it's a lot worse because it's a lot more widely spread across the whole of the economy. But this is a public health crisis that's impacting on the economy. And you know, you'll have seen from um, our Q3 results that like many of the UK banks, we've been able to absorb enormous loan growth as we've supported our customers. Um, but also at the same time, been able to absorb really significant impairments. And I think this is a really, really important point because the financial strength of the banking sector and the banks like the Royal Bank and Matt West, I think is going to be critical to the recovery. We came into the crisis in a really strong uh, financial position with strong capital, liquidity and funding. And I think because of that, um, we're going to be able to support our customers and be a big part of the recovery. Now, back in February of this year, um, our new, or relatively new CEO at the time, she's been in the job for a year now, Alison Rose, announced our new purpose-led strategy. And that strategy was all about how we support individuals, families, and businesses to thrive across the whole of the UK. 
Now, we could never have expected back in February that that purpose would be tested so so soon. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that that purpose-led approach has really guided us in all of the decisions that we've made uh, and, and a great deal of the action that, that we've swung into through the crisis. But just to finish up for me, COVID isn't the only thing that should be in our minds at the moment. It's clearly the preoccupation that before COVID, we were all talking about Brexit and it's back. It's immediately ahead of us and it will bring additional challenges. And I'm sure Stephen Blackman will talk about that in a wee while. But also COVID hasn't removed the need for us to think about some other really big societal issues, climate change, inclusion and equality, developing new skills for the workforce, including financial education and of course, digital capability ever more important given how we've pivoted to be so digital like we are today. And I think all of these facets will feature in the Royal Bank strategy as key pillars going forward so that we can contribute to a sustainable recovery. And for me, I think it's really important the Royal Bank will be helping families, people and businesses thrive in Glasgow post COVID and also across the rest of the Scotland. That's very clearly what our purpose is going forward. So well, I hope you really enjoy the event today. I want it to be informative. Uh, thought provoking, but ultimately hopefully helpful for you as you're thinking about what you do in your businesses. And with that, I will hand back to Stuart. Thank you. Thanks very much, Malcolm. We are, as ever, delighted to be working with Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, we have a, a busy agenda today um, to come uh, Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, Nicola Taylor, Derek Proven, and Keith Anderson. Um, but um, we've also kept the chat function open today. So if you want to make um, comments, uh, or throw in ideas, please uh, use that function. If you want to ask a question, though, which we'll use later on with the, the speakers in the panel towards the uh, end of the event, uh, please use the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll be posing all the questions, or some of the questions, depending on how many we get, um, once all the speakers have contributed. Um, so we will be uh, uh, holding the questions until the end, if you don't mind. To get us underway, um, we're delighted to, to welcome um, Stephen Blackman, who is a Principal Economist and Director of uh, Strategic Research for Royal Bank of Scotland, Nat West Group. Um, Stephen's role is to help the board and the executive committee to make strategic decisions um, in response to the, the most uh, profound trends uh, that are facing their customers, our wider stakeholders, and of course, the bank. So can I pass over to you, Stephen, to give us your thoughts? You certainly can, Stuart. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for joining uh, this afternoon. We only have 10 minutes each, um, but I do want to kind of say thank you very much uh, for being part of such an awesome kind of uh, fellow panellists. It's a real honour to be here. And actually, 10 minutes is a fantastic kind of discipline because I really need to focus on the things that I think are the most important. Um, for all of us, business, as individuals, as communities, cities, west of Scotland more generally, in Scotland, UK, whichever way you kind of want to cut it. And I think arguably one of the most important trends of the last 30 years, even the last 50 years, has been the so-called economics of superstars. And what this actually is, or the separation of outcomes, whether that's in terms of incomes, whether that's in terms of revenue for businesses, the way that businesses grow, into kind of winners and losers. And actually, one of my favorite economists, um, aside from Anton, of course, uh, uh, is uh, a chap called Alan Kruger. He was a, a one-time chief economic advisor to Barack Obama. Um, now, Alan sadly died way, way too early uh, last year, but he's well known uh, for his insight into the economics of the music industry. Glasgow, very famous for music. But this, I think, is a really important point because what he tries to tell in a way that's really compelling and actually what's really important is communicating in a way that people can, can resonate and understand is how technology, and in particular in this instance for music, mass communication, the ability to reach a global audience, whether that's through the introduction of you know, the gramophone or the radio, later on record CDs and now kind of digital music, increased the audience share, actually increased the total amount of revenues for the music industry, but actually led to those revenues being, um, in a sense, apportioned or kind of gained by a smaller share of music producers. And that's actually 
you know, the economics of the superstar uh, like our idea, a world increasingly divided, aided by technology into kind of winners and losers. And it, it spans kind of industries. We can think clearly in terms of sports stars, but we're seeing it in terms of the digital industry, whether in terms of universities, whichever way you want to kind of cut it, and in terms of disciplines as well. And if you have to only to think of the current polit political situation, whether that's Trumpism, whether that's Brexit, all playing out in real time, ultimately, at least in part, driven by the separation of kind of winners and losers driven by superstar economics. And I could talk about kind of Glasgow kind of music hall in the Victorian era and the entertainers in there that started in the pubs of Glasgow and then when they tried to clean up their, their image in the early Edwardian age and with the, kind of the opening up of Glasgow's uh, uh, pavilion and palace. But again, as I say, the introduction of the gramophone and television meant that the wider audience meant for some people, some entertainers, incomes went up, but for others, they lost a kind of source of con continuous income, particularly for those in, in the middle. And the reason I want to talk about this is because loathe as much as any person in the alphabet soup of economics, is this a L-shaped recovery or, or a V-shaped? One that does resonate with me has been what's known as the K-shaped, i.e. COVID, causing an increase. We all know that COVID has been a great accelerant of trends. We get to digitization and other trends in a minute, but those trends increasingly being divisive into kind of winners and, and losers. And I think the first stage of COVID was as much about unity, but that quickly fell away actually. And this second stage that we're in at the moment is much more about an unevenness. And a great separator between businesses and individuals has actually been, or particularly for businesses, has been kind of digital adoption. Um, and because when many people think of trends, they think they're universal and they are, but how they affect individuals and how they affect individual businesses is actually felt un unevenly. And if we look at the first slide that I want to share with you today, this is the great accelerant in terms of the digital transfer uh, formation. And what we've actually seen is when we're seeing in terms of the amount of um, customer interactions that have been digitized since March across Europe, we've had trends of five years worth of that trend. When we look at what's happening in terms of the, the services or products that have been partially di uh, digitized, that has actually seen an acceleration in trend of seven years over the last eight to nine months. And when we look at transactions, online transactions, which were already, all of these were growing quickly, you know, these weren't uh, slow trends pre, uh, pre kind of COVID, has actually accelerated by five years kind of uh, since March. And I think that what we're seeing is bus some businesses that have adapted quite quickly. So these are the business adaptation of the digital kind of world. And we're seeing some businesses that have embraced that, have done things that they didn't think were possible in terms of digitization. And we get on to how they've utilized that and are actually seeing, in a sense, revenues either stay the same or actually increase. And others, partly to do with sectors, I'm not discounting the sectoral impact here, but actually also to do with the digital adoption, struggling much, much more. And this is all being set within a wider framework of kind of big, what I call kind of social change, what we're seeing in terms of the next slide, actually, Anna, if possible. And rather than list all the kind of mega trends that I think are being caused by COVID, it's all very logical and you could talk about changes to kind of the way we work and the way we shop and the way that we interact with government and all that type of stuff. But actually, if you break this down and rebuild it, I think there are four key themes of COVID for businesses and for individuals and wider society. I think the first one is it resets relationships. Now, clearly it resets relationships in terms of digitization, you need to share digital technology for health reasons, all that type of stuff. But I think for firms, it's an opportunity to reset relationships with customers. Increasingly a, a relationship that's being lived in both a digital and a kind of physical presence as well. And actually one of the things we're seeing is an acceleration of people understanding what works in the digital framework and what works in the physical world, i.e the need to go for walks <laughs> for kind of mental health and other kind of reasons. That's that kind of tool that we need from the physical world, which we then get back to and spend the rest of our, our day kind of uh, online. 
Um, so I think it's an opportunity to reset uh, relationships. It's an opportunity to repurpose place, clearly in terms of the propensity to work from home. Interesting analysis to that today from the Institute of Directors, you know, in terms of the proportion of people, of firms that will be spending, you know, having their employees work from home, an opportunity to focus more on local areas and how this is changing depending on place. And I'll get to that using our own internal big data. Reassessing value and values in terms of what's important for customers and for wider society. We touched on that with purpose or, or Malcolm did. And also, it's not just about digitization. It's the modulization and adaptation of those assets, the monetization, the valuization of those assets, that in a sense, extracting value. How do we monetize those? And this is why I've included using digitization to have art clubs for museums, a nice kind of mashup the digital technology used in a new way to reach kind of a new audience and to connect in a relational way in the terms to build connections and ultimately to monetize i think and that's about as much about building resilience as all the other kind of things so if we move on to, to the next slide just briefly i think one i want to share is just how important this work from home is and what i've forgotten to show on the bottom axis is if you move along to the right there that's how suitable a job is to home working. And you can see that there's a clear skills or pay differential. Higher the skill, the higher the propensity to work from home. And therefore it's not shared evenly, whether across genders or ethnicities, clearly across skill levels. And actually, very briefly, because we only have 10 minutes, moving on to the next slide, that clearly has key geographic outcomes because not all jobs are equally distributed across local areas. And what we're seeing is, you know, a cluster of jobs that are able to be uh, done from home, at least in a sense, the majority of that work are done from home. And I think it will end up being a blended model, by the way, um, uh, clustered around our key cities. And in Scotland, you know, that is Glasgow and Edinburgh principally, but also Aberdeen and to a slightly lesser extent, kind of Dundee as well. Um, uh, and particularly, as I say, particularly for men who will be kind of focused much more on home areas in terms of their political focus, their commercial focus, all these types of things do make big differences. And I just want to finish on uh, using to share with you actually our data that we've just announced today, you know, uh, this week. And we're actually using our transactions and the payments of millions of our customers across Scotland and across the UK to actually try and find out in real time, actually what's happening to kind of local communities. And if we see on the next slide, some really interesting things are being, beginning to emerge in terms of what's happening. So we're seeing that across Britain or Scotland's communities, and here we have parliamentary constituencies, we see that about one in five individuals have seen their income fall by about, um, by at least 20%. But actually uh, in London, and also our most rural areas, particularly the rural areas that depend on tourism, um, is actually fallen by uh, one in four, 25%. But actually this is a young person's story and we're seeing increasing evidence um, of young people being hit particularly hard. And when you combine those things, London uh, and the young, but actually large cities more generally and the young, you can see that actually up to potentially kind of one in three or a third of young people in our biggest cities, particularly London, um, and in our most rural as well, have seen their incomes fall by more than 20%. So when we think about actually what's happening across the west of Scotland and Glasgow, I see some trends emerging. One is, as I say, clearly young people are hit and we need to kind of um, 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 address that. But as I said, we see that COVID being a great accelerant, but like Pandora's box, the last thing that came out of that clearly was hope. But here hope, I think, is kind of dressed up or disguised or in a sense wearing the mask of dislocation, an opportunity to potentially redress some of those global trends with kind of winners and losers that we've seen in the last 30 years. Because Actually, those communities that have performed been hit less hard on where spending is actually holding up much better as it moves out of key cities like London and back to smaller kind of particularly town, you know, has been in towns, particularly places that are self-contained in terms of they have jobs, a place for jobs as well as a place for people are kind of living.
And I think it is difficult, particularly for those in the experiential industry and that, you know, so whether that's in terms of museums or clubs or whatever it happens to be. But whereas we saw with the economics of superstars, we were seeing ever increasing homogenized, bigger venues that pulled in global talent and kind of sucked away local to a certain extent. Is this now an opportunity to rebuild slightly that gives local uh, businesses and local talent a bit more of a kind of look in? Um, I'm not saying it's, you know, that's going to happen in its entirety. Clearly uh, winners and losers in terms of the amortization of the economy is growing quite strongly. But as we tend to kind of think about the, the local area, at least we're getting a kind of foot in uh, for local businesses and for local talent. And I hope that we can harness that to try and redress some of those global imbalances that have been growing over the last 30 years or so. I think that's my 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much and hand back to Stuart. Thanks, Stephen. Excellent. A couple of very big themes in there around, um, I suppose it is a bit about levelling up, uh, and uh, but on the other hand, some of the really strong impacts on the young and on large cities, and of course Glasgow shares in that concern. Um, we can now move to our next uh, speaker, so thanks very much for that, uh, Stephen. Um, very pleased to uh, welcome um, to the, uh, the, the event this, this afternoon um, a, a very strong friend of the Chamber of Commerce and, of course, of Glasgow in Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, um, who is, of course, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Glasgow. He is, as Stephen says, a, an economist by profession uh, with research interests uh, stretching across monetary economics, um, central bank independence, fiscal policy, and international finance. So we're delighted that uh, Anton's going to be able to share with us some of his observations on both the university uh, and the city with views on uh, policies that may help us move through the crisis and beyond. So uh, welcome, Sir Anton, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. And can I thank you and the Chamber for inviting me to participate in this uh, afternoon and and thanks also to the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, for, for uh, um, being the headline for this event. Um, what I thought I would do, as you say, is to use my remarks just to step back a bit from the day to day and offer some reflections on the economic recovery ahead of us. And actually, Stephen has preempted a couple of the points I was going to make, but hopefully I I I'll add to them. Uh, there are four points, basically, I'd like to highlight uh, in this regard. I as I say, in the main, these stem from my perspective at the university, but hopefully they hold wider applicability for a city and the region at large. My first point is I think in terms of uh, the, the current economic crisis and economic downturn is that we need to learn from the legacy of past economic downturns. Um, many of us remember the recession of the early 1980s, uh, the deep impact this had on Glasgow at a time when the region was already battling industrial decline and unemployment hovered around 15% for most of that decade, the 1980s, doing untold damage to lives and, and livelihoods and increasing inequality. And you know, fast forward, and, and we know that COVID is fundamentally reshaping our economy and that this process will continue even with the very encouraging news about the efficacy of the, of the first of the vaccine in phase three, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And actually, I just wrote to two of our alumni who are heavily involved with that, with that effort at the, at the top of Pfizer. Uh, just to congratulate them on, on their success today. Um, and when we look at the crisis, it, it's all too apparent of just how unequal the impact has been, as, as Stephen was saying, both from an economic and social perspective. Um, and Stephen introduced uh, the concept of a K-shaped recovery, which I certainly subscribe to. I've, I've used in some recent presentations. It's one that was, uh, I think, introduced, first of all, in, in the US uh, commentary around, around the recovery. And, that, and as, uh, as this suggests, it would see a disparity between winners and losers. And we, we are absolutely seeing that both at the personal level, but also in terms of sectors. You know, on the downside, we have tourism and hospitality businesses, airlines, conferencing, anything that involves social contact. On the upside, we've seen tech companies, financial services, and those businesses most resilient to external shocks. And if you want to really see the difference, just have a look at some of the components of some of the stock market indices and see how different companies have done in terms of the re recent roller coasters uh, uh, in stock markets. And while the number of people employed in areas like financial services across Glasgow has risen sharply in recent years, and of course the sector now supports around 40,000 jobs region-wide, 
We also know that in terms of the downside of the crisis, tourism and hospitality accounts for more than 8% of total employment in Scotland. And, uh, and the continued viability of these jobs is really an important real world consideration. Now, as an economist, I mean, I, I said throughout all of this that the chancellor was right to, uh, to, to use the furlough scheme and to use job protection as an instrument at this point of the crisis. And I think he's right to have extended it through to March. I might have some quibbles about whether he might have wanted to take account of dead weight across different sectors, but I think it was absolutely right to extend it. However, it's, it's really important to recognize that it's still extremely difficult to project the level of unemployment next year and beyond. And I think yesterday's statistics, I think, put the official unemployment rate at 4.8% across the UK and 4.5% in Scotland. But we know that that will increase once the job support scheme end. And the Bank of England predicts that unemployment will reach 7.8% next year. And the OBR is even gloomier, predicting, I think, a rate of 11.9%. And in this context, I think it's important to note that Glasgow was amongst the areas with the highest percentage of furloughed employees across Scotland. So we are, we are exposed. And the potential social consequences are stark for businesses, for individuals. Uh, we know the lowest ten, earning 10% 10 of workers were seven times as likely as the highest earners to work in sectors that closed during the March lockdown. I expect it's going to be very similar if we, if, if we have further restrictions. Uh, and this cohort is also, as Stephen said, much less likely to be able to work from home. And, and within this, the pandemic continues to have a disproportionate impact on the young, on working women, on ethnic minorities. The IFS found that women are around a third more likely to work in a sector heavily affected by the pandemic. Uh, and we know the impact was heavily gendered of the earlier lockdown in terms of, of, of homeschooling and childcare and so on. And as a result, I think policymakers really need to give serious consideration to how COVID has exacerbated pre-existing economic inequalities. I, and I know others will have a lot to say about the support the city's business community requires right now as we remain in tier three of the uh, government's, Scottish government's restrictions. But we also must cast our minds forward towards a recovery that's inclusive and works and for and reaches all sectors of society. Now let me come to education and skills because obviously as a university leader, I'm particularly concerned about the potential for labor market scarring and, and the impact of the pandemic uh, on young people. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I was invited to be a member of the Scottish Government's Independent Advisory Group on Economic Recovery, which was chaired by Benny Higgins. And the AGR was absolutely clear about the importance of an education-led response to the pandemic. Learning loss was a really disruptive feature of the initial stage of the crisis. Data from England and Wales suggest that the average learning loss was three months for all pupils, rising to four months for pupils uh, at schools in the most deprived areas. And we've seen similar problems around literacy uh, from Ofsted data. And, and this is a serious long-term challenge. You know, we can't afford a lost generation due to the pandemic. So we must act now to devise an approach which identifies and supports specific groups of young people who've fallen behind. And this applies to all education levels and all settings. Uh, at the university, we work very hard to support students from widening backgrounds, widening participation backgrounds and those with caring responsibilities, which are two groups that we know have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. And in addition, between April and August, our hardship fund distributed over one and a half million in support of our students, which I think gives you an idea of the scale of the financial impact on our student body. Now projecting forward, I think it's clear we need a much broader focus on skills, uh, successful innovations such as graduate apprenticeships require support. Uh, and we have a very successful uh, scheme around software engineering in Glasgow to support financial services, along improved provision of lifelong learning. Uh, and this is something we've long talked about in Scotland. And whilst there's a lot of good work uh, going on across industry and FE and HE, I think we do need to step up that collaboration, particularly at, at a regional level. Now, uh, coming back to a point that Stephen made about superstar um, effects, uh, economic effects, we're very lucky, actually, that we have two universities in Scotland in the world's top 100. Ourselves at the University of Glasgow and the University of Edinburgh, we have four in the top 200. And I, and I think that's really important because I, I think, if anything, the digital, the rush to digital, we found that we had to embrace in COVID, as Stephen said, it's actually created um, some fantastic assets in, in some of our existing universities. So on top of that, we have this wonderful research base. So I think we are uniquely place to cluster activity, to leverage industry investment, and to drive spin outs, but also in terms of skills to really leverage the, the move to digital 
that we have actually managed to, to, to take advantage of over the last few months. Now, this brings me to my third consideration. I think leveraging our international connections in support of the regional economy. Um, attracting business to invest in Glasgow is, I think, critical to our future growth. Outside of London, Scotland has been the top performing nation uh, or, or region in the UK in attracting inv inward investment for each of the past seven years. We must act to protect this. I know the Scottish and Glasgow chambers have been active in this regard, hosting delegations from Rotterdam and the US uh, uh, last year and taking part in many virtual um, visits as well. Nevertheless, there are real challenges in this space. In this space. Uh, Brexit was already, has been already mentioned and we'll have to work hard if we're to safeguard our international position. I've already certainly said publicly that Brexit is now going to happen. It's going to be a very thin trade deal. So I'm afraid we're going to have to accept that we're going to have to pivot our economies to those sectors that are less exposed to Brexit. So areas like automotive and aerospace may be more exposed and we need to be careful to pivot towards sectors like tech, perhaps that are in life sciences that perhaps may, may, may be less exposed. But you know, I'm very conscious as a leader of a world-changing university of the factors in our favor. Beyond Glasgow's heritage and culture, the strength and diversity of our economic base, I think, remain key drivers, leveraging in talent and investment. And, and maintaining and enhancing this international position, to my mind, is absolutely vital, uh, particularly around high growth areas, as I said, such as tech and med tech. Now, with time against me, I want to briefly mention my fourth and final point, uh, which is around greening the economy, which uh, goes some, some way to linking all these factors together. Uh, we must build back in a way that prioritizes a green recovery. Uh, we know that we're facing a climate emergency. We can't pass up the opportunity to address this. I think the US election actually makes it more likely that uh, some of these measures will be implemented. I know Keith Anderson will say more about this shortly because of the great work that his company does around, around this. I want to emphasize that next year, the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow and COP26 is a huge opportunity and must be harnessed. Uh, already the city has outlined ambitions target, uh, an ambitious target to reach net zero by 2030. As at the University of Glasgow, we're really pleased to support this agenda. We're about to make an announcement of, of, of our um, strategy for getting to net zero by 2030. And we've established a center for sustainable solutions, which really supports interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral solutions to climate change. Now, ultimately, I think a green job strategy can work for Glasgow. It can place us in the vanguard of a movement for global action and change. And of course, this focus must be combined with support for existing companies and existing jobs. But we, if we are determined to build back better, then greening the economy, I think, has the potential to provide our young people with secure employment, attract investment in the Scotland, and guard against any repeat of the kind of damaging legacy we faced previous recessions like the 1980s. So there are no quick fixes here, but remaining flexible, future focused, and by evolving as the pandemic does, we, I think we can identify innovative ways to support key sectors and support new jobs. So thank you, Stuart. I look forward to the discussion in the panel in a, in a moment. Excellent, thank you, Anton. Four key points, learn the legacy of the past, particularly around inequalities um, in previous crises, education, uh, led recovery um, and particularly dealing with the impact of learning loss, leveraging international connections and, and I really hope COP26 is one of the best opportunities we're ever going to have to do that um, and then obviously related build uh, uh, build back better to a green recovery. Fantastic. Lots of material for us to dig into there. But you also mentioned um, that tourism and hospitality has been right at the cutting edge, if you like, of the damage that's being done uh, and it makes up 8% of the Scottish economy. So that's a nice little segue into our next speaker. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Nicola Taylor, who is the Chief Executive and owner of Chardon Hotels, which operates six IHG hotels in Scotland. Um, Nicola's is, uh, Nicola is going to give us uh, an insight into uh, the pandemic impact on the city's hotels and hospitality industry with some thoughts on how uh, other countries have dealt with the virus uh, to keep the industry in operation. So over to you, Nicola. Apologies, I was struggling to unmute myself. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. 
Good, great. Well, thank you for that introduction, Stuart, and thank you um, for having me. Um, Chardon, um, for many of you, won't be a name that you know, but we are a family business operating in Glasgow uh, for almost 50 years. In fact, my parents have been operating hotels, restaurants and bars uh, in Glasgow since the 1960s. Uh, and I might add, we've always been funded by RBS, so I'm going to have to behave myself um, when the big bosses are around um, on this. So we currently own and operate, just to put it into some context for you, um, I'm trying to move on to my next slide, here we go, um, six hotels in Scotland under franchise from IHG. The Holiday Inn at the top of West Nile Street in Glasgow, which we built, or my father built 25 years ago. Um, the AA Rosette La Bona Berge Brasserie, which was launched in the city in Bastille Day in 1975. So it's been serving the city for over 45 years during the ups and downs that others have referred to. Um, and we also own five Holiday Inn Expresses, uh, one again at the, the top of West Nile Street in Glasgow, Edinburgh Airport, off the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, Perth and Dunfermline. Now, when I was sent the agenda, I was absolutely delighted um, to see myself in the middle. Um, and for those of you who have managed groups of people for a while, which many will, of you will have done, um, you'll remember the old training when you were delivering your, your poor message to the team member, which was the praise sandwich. Um, and I was hoping that I was in the middle of the praise sandwich with the economists and the bank coming first. Um, and then following me, Derek, and, and, and at the end, hearing some very positive news um, from Scottish Power, but I'm, I'm not convinced that the economists really, really did that for us. Um, but here goes, just to remind ourselves, Glasgow is a great city. It's reinvented itself more than any other city that I could really think of, or perhaps except Beirut. Um, the people are great. Um, and the Glasgow slogan, people make Glasgow, really sums us up perfectly. Having grown up in Glasgow, I'm exceptionally proud to be Glaswegian, first and then Scottish. Before joining our hospitality business in 2003, I spent 20 years in London, where I made it my business not to lose my Glaswegian accent. When I came home, we started a hotel management company, Shard and Management, um, and we were running a variety of branded and unbranded hotels across the UK and Ireland, mainly under franchise with Hilton, IHG, Accor, Best Western, and also some unbranded hotels like Drayton Manor Park and United Union's Hotel down in Eastbourne. And at our peak, out of our Glasgow office, we operated around 60 hotels um, with about 3,000 employees and for a variety of owners, including private equity, banks, and of course, family businesses like our own. And then in 2014, I decided that I wanted to stay home in Scotland a bit more. Um, and we sold that business to Interstate Hotels and Resorts, who are the largest hotel management company in the world. And they used the platform that we had built here in Glasgow to grow their business across continental Europe um, and into Russia. And that division now employs 15 and a half thousand people across these regions um, with over 100 hotels under management. And in fact, their parent company um, operates 1400 hotels out of North America. So enough about me and, and, and why I've been asked to, to, to speak. Um, and I think that the guys referred to it from a commercial perspective, the hospitality, retail and travel and tourism business appear to be taking the brunt of the pandemic and what I call our financial crisis. And we often say there's nothing more expensive than an empty bedroom, but the same I'm sure could be said by Derek when he talks about an aircraft, but I'll let him carry on talking about that. I'm focusing on hotels, not restaurants, bars, or any other part of, of, of travel or tourism. And whilst we can move the booking and, and elements and digitize elements of the experience, we cannot move our physical product online. We aren't a tin of beans, a pair of trousers, a luro. Um, you actually have to come and turn up for us to give you the service that you're looking for. Um, and as large expensive pieces of real estate within major cities and around the country, 
we are, as an industry contribute a huge amount to the exchequer. Probably the biggest element and, and the reason that so many young people have, have, have not found jobs is employment. Um, not just in our own business and hotels, but the, the supply chain that, that helps us operate and deliver our product. And with minimum wage around £17,000 per annum, this has increased by almost 50% in six years. And in fact, each time it goes up at 5% per annum, per annum, per annum, it will cost a hotel company about 175 to £200,000 if they employ about 250 people because you've got the wage differential, because not everybody that works in our industry is on, on minimum wage. VAT, we contribute um, or did contribute 20%. Clearly that has come down, um, whilst we have no business, to 5%. But versus the rest of Europe, who sit at around 7%, it's a massive part of, of our takings. And on top of that, business property rates, again, the highest in Europe. And in fact, Scotland has the highest contribution to business property rates in the hospitality sector of between five and 7% of our sales. So before we even look at our operating costs, which are clearly increasing, we actually have to look at the fact that every pound that we take between 25 pence and 27 pence of our sales goes in tax. So I'm about to share some STR data on hotels occupancy rate and yield. Yield is what we call REVPAR, which is revenue per available room. And under charter house rules of 260 of you, um, I'm really sharing these slides to illustrate where, where we are. Um, now STR are a global data company who run all the daily and future forecasts for hotel occupancy, rate and rev par, as I mentioned, and they operate this across the world. I think we need to be honest that before the pandemic, we were an industry under severe financial pressure. There was an oversupply of hotel bedrooms in key cities, which were fueling our inability to raise our prices to pay all these increasing costs as there was too much supply and not enough demand. You can't build a hotel for the Commonwealth Games or for COP. You need to build a hotel that's sustainable throughout 52 weeks of the year, seven days a week, to make the economics of it work in what is notoriously a cyclical business. Now this slide here, which is quite a busy slide, is, is purely on the Glasgow market and was from a slide that we pulled together in 2019, July 2019, pre-COVID. And the green bars are showing you the occupancy, which you can see obviously goes up and down, but, but was declining. The yellow bar is the rate, but the more frightening trend is from August 2014, around, you know, around about the Commonwealth Games. And the red line is on the revenue per available room and it's done as a moving annual total. And you can see as the number of rooms has increased, the ability for us to actually make up more in the economy becomes harder and harder. The bubbles at the side, um, the, the first one at the top is what that's showing you is that there was a 9.1% increase in the number of hotel bedrooms in Glasgow up until July, the year up until July, 2019. And the demand was well below that at 4.7%. During the, during the pandemic, um, the following bubble is showing you what was under construction over this period of 17% more rooms with no more increased demand. And the bubble at the bottom, the purple bubble, is actually showing you that there was almost 60% of hotels that had planning in Glasgow alone, which is quite a frightening number. Um, if you're me, if you're me, I can assure you. So what's very interesting um, is hotel rev par, new word, bit like furlough, um, mirrors the economy and makes and that makes perfect sense. When we are feeling um, confidence, the consumer's confident, 
business confidence comes through and we're all doing well, funnily enough, our businesses uh, do well. Eating and drinking as, as sort of 1.9% has probably not been impacted anything like the hotel business because there's so little travel both internationally and even domestically and of course through the, the business travel that we normally have as well. I think that if you were to look in the cities, the decline of 36.9% would be considerably more, but the rural and, and suburban areas have actually helped support that and resorts. So when we opened our own business of six hotels on the 1st of July, we went into August about with about 20% occupancy on the books, clearly a very low for August. Um, and we ended the month which with around 50%. Clearly, the rates that we were able to charge were way back. And in fact, sales across those six hotels declined year on year by 70%. And I have to say that has been the best month that we've had. Pick up in the UK um, for the next 28 days is around 1%, which is absolutely shocking. Um, and you're looking at occupancies of 12%. And you, what's even more frightening is Scottish cities are trailing behind the English ones as the most heavily impacted. And it feels a bit like the, the better your hotel site was pre-COVID, the worse it is today, which is why you'll find Edinburgh and London probably the most heavily impacted. This is a, a you know a chart. I've, I've, I've added Edinburgh into it just because we're obviously the central corridor. But you can see that bookings, um, the, the key on the side is, is occupancy, how low it is in forward bookings until July next year. And that's all I've got the data for at this stage. In all honesty, our staff were too scared to come to work um, at the start of the pandemic, never mind to deal with the public. But being part of a global brand does give you some insights. And clearly this pandemic started in China and IHG are the largest hotel and brand operator in that region. They are four months and one week to be precise ahead of us, but their knowledge of the pandemic shutting down the country was much greater and swifter than ours. They are already back having huge events and thousands of people. The Chinese, people themselves, the international travellers, are not coming outside China. So any loss of international business or tourism that would go into China in the hotel industry is being supported by their domestic leisure market. And this slide will show you um, where we are in the world. The, the darker blue is probably the more, the, the more important because that's actually showing you the occupancy of hotels around the world and confirms that China has an occupancy today of 69% compared with the rest of the world. And I think really what I'm trying to show you here is the market does come back. It's just that we've got a very, very bumpy ride at the moment. And in fact, in China, their overall sales in August were only back 10% on the previous year. And in North America, it will come as no surprise to any of us, that they have kept on traveling um, and therefore they haven't been as badly affected. Um, their red part has dropped, but as you see versus the COVID cases, they really just continued on. Um, and you'll see again, as I mentioned, the tier one, what they call tier one, the, the key cities. So for example, Edinburgh and London will take much, much longer to recover to anything like the levels and, and revenues that they were making in 2019. And some forecasters are suggesting that'll be more like 2024 or even 2025. And that was before we had this second lockdown. Very sadly, European hotels are the poorest performing part of the world. Um, what is odd is not every European country is declining at the same rate. And if we include Turkey as part of Europe, they are leading the way with an occupancy of almost 45%. So getting back to the good news, um, we are really, really delighted um, about the vaccine, um, which will hopefully bring a much needed boost to consumer confidence 
because a lot of this is about consumer confidence and we need that moving into 2021. We don't expect, anticipate a massive influx of international travellers, but we really hope to hear the tills in the shops in Buchanan Street ringing in the run up to Christmas and may they remain open. The restaurants, bars, nightlife get back up and running again, along with the many tourist attractions and events, allowing us the ability in our hotels to welcome visitors and locals back to this great city. Clearly, we anticipate hotel closures on the back of, of that, and we hope some increased demand will slowly bring us out of the crisis, ideally as quickly as China bounces back. We can already see this as corporates are coming back to work and traveling. Although as soon as Glasgow was added into the lockdown list a month or so ago, the phone just rang off the hook again with cancellations. However, the market that we operate in the mid scale and budget are outperforming, as you would expect, the luxury end of the market, except in some rural areas. We all have also have something new. We are selling daylight rooms, perhaps not something they're running out in Amsterdam, but people can, who can work from home or an office anymore and want their own quiet space to work from, a bedroom with great Wi-Fi, their own loo, without the kids looking for constant entertainment. Takeout has been successful, but not something we've got into. It isn't as lucrative if you're paying Deliveroo 35%. Clearly, like all companies, we've had to implement new training processes and procedures to deal with COVID and in fact, any virus. But to be honest, they're the same chemicals that we've always been using and the same processes and procedures. We're just changing the cloth in each room versus what we were doing before. It's fair to say that our teams are desperate to get back to work. Um, and, and they're also delighted because our six hotels are at the number one spot within IHG across Europe in their league tables for cleanliness, PPE, etc. I won't play you the video, but I think it's really important before I hand that back to Stuart to just remind everybody that the powerful part of hospitality is no two days are the same. We are used to constant change and we thrive on it. We adapt very quickly under pressure. It's what makes this industry, along with the arts, employ some of the happiest people at work. Neither industries are renowned for being hugely well paid, but we have great fun and people are genuinely happy to be there to welcome you. So with that bit of good news, I'm gonna hand back to Stuart. Thank you, Nicola. Um very uh, upbeat, uh, despite the obviously really tricky uh, figures that you are showing us in the slides. Can I therefore now move on to our next speaker, a very warm welcome to Derek Proven, who is Chief Executive of AGS Airports, which owns Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton airports. Um, Derek's been a vocal campaigner for the aviation industry uh, throughout the crisis, urging interventions on issues like quarantine rules and air bridges. Um, the Chamber fundamentally believes in the importance of international trade and tourism, and the airport is, of course, our most important transport connection. So can I ask, uh, hand it over rather to Derek. Thank you, Stuart, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'll keep this short because I know we have a, some Q&A uh, later on. So, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to be as positive that I am in one of those interest, uh, industries that were first impacted by this virus and are likely to be one of the last to come back out of that impact. And of course, we feel that greatly as we move forward. But just, just before I heap on all of the challenges that we've had and we see moving forward, I think one of the things that this virus did do to us as a, an organization early on is really strip back to the values that we have as a business. And you know, our motto is that we're proud to serve Scotland, but we're also proud to serve the cities and the communities in which we operate across all three airports. And I think uh, that was brought to the fore virtually on the second week where we made the intervention to ensure that all Glasgow's homeless um, were rehoused into hotels 
uh, at the start of this pandemic and have been ever since. And I think from a, a values perspective within the business, we continue, we are looking at food banks. Uh, just now we do many, many charitable events because well, we have staff who can't work. They still want to be involved in society and help in this pandemic any way we can. Um, we have had to make numerous um, and large scale redundancies, uh, but they've only started in the last few weeks because again, the commitment that we made to our people was that for a long, as long as it was a, a furlough and we could understand what the future market would look like, we would keep people employed. Unfortunately, now that we look at the future market, that becomes something very different. So today I wanted to talk probably around three areas. One, the impacts that we've had uh, based on this pandemic. Two, what we think that means going forward. And three, what the response we feel is required to make the proper interventions for the industry. So as I say, we were certainly first hit. Um, early on in the crisis, March and April, we went down to 2% of revenue. And we maintained that level pretty much all of the way through the summer period. Because of the nature of the business for large infrastructure, and whether we have one aircraft flying into an airport or we've got 100 aircraft flying into an airport, predominantly we need the same services at the airport. Um, we made the decision never to close. We believe that we've got a responsibility to the country. Uh, so many people fly through our airports who are on lifeline, require lifeline services from the highlands and islands. We wanted to maintain the oil and gas industry in the UK. And in Southampton, we support the Channel Islands very much like we do the Scottish uh, Islands. And so we've stayed open throughout. If I look at the volumes that we have today, particularly with the lockdown in England, uh, we at the highest point managed to go to minus 88% business. Uh, we're now heading back to minus 98% business um, with a loss of uh, the, inter uh, the, sorry, the domestic travel. We are only short by the Canary Islands in Scotland at this moment in time. So effectively, we've never got out of minus 95 since the start of this pandemic, but we've maintained 80% uh, of our cost base. What does that mean? It means hundreds of millions of pounds of losses. It means double figure tens of millions on a monthly basis every month uh, that we've been operating. And of course, that means that we have from a liquidity perspective, we have to ensure that we are fit for the future. But that fitness, as Malcolm had highlighted earlier on, uh, means more debt in the organisation. And that has a big impact when we look at how the market is looking to pan out uh, later on. To put it into some perspective for you, today I agreed a deal with uh, one of our largest airline uh, airlines to house a significant number of aircraft at Glasgow. So airlines are still grounding fleets of aircraft today. Nothing's changed in the aviation industry. And I was on a call yesterday with the, the Scottish government, uh, and that on that call included some of the key airlines operating out of Scotland. And nothing more stark from the message from those airlines to Scottish government could have been clearer. And that was Scotland and the UK are falling far behind other EU states with regards to the support that they're providing for the industry. As airlines, we will move our assets to wherever we get the best commercial return. And where there is no support for the industry, then there will be no aircraft in the UK. That was the message that went to the Scottish government yesterday. So again, you can see just how challenging that lays the future of uh, the industry. And so what is the, for me, what are the, the key issues that we see moving forward? There are two. The first is contraction. So airlines have handed back all of their wet and dry lease aircraft. They've stopped the fleet renewals uh, processes and orders that they had in place. Rolls-Royce won't move back to a manufacturing point similar to pre-pandemic until 2025. Uh, Boeing have stopped the manufacture of all aircraft until next year. And of course, when these order forms start to switch back on again, there's a two year lag between the time that it starts and the time that um, those, these assets start to hit the market again. So we are very, very clear that um, 
within that uh, contraction, we are also seeing airlines that are now looking to the future with less aircraft. EasyJet have already announced that they have reduced the fleet by 34, which is roughly about a 12% reduction in aircraft size for next year. Of course, the key issue is by 2023, they look to double that fleet contraction. So again, this isn't, you know, it has to be one of the key messages I'd want to send out to everybody listening today, especially to governments, is aviation isn't a light switch. Next year, it doesn't just come back. The decisions that are made today have got long-term effects on the industry. And of course, if they've got long-term effects on the industry, they've got long-term effects on the countries and the cities that we serve. And that takes me to the second issue, which is consolidation. If there are less aircraft, less airlines and less people to operate them, but the same number of cities to be served, then consolidation will take place. And connectivity will change because routes will go and airlines will be left in a position with the assets that they have available to them to decide what regions are they going to serve and what ones are they not. And of course, if we look at Glasgow as a city and the very nature of the central belt, then we have to be clear that the consolidation will take place. We're already seeing it. Uh, we're seeing it in Glasgow from a positives perspective where Emirates have now decided to no longer operate out of Edinburgh at the very least for the next 18 months and consolidate all of their Edinburgh and Glasgow flights to Glasgow. Of course, that can operate in the other direction. And secondly, if we look at uh, British Airways, British Airways have pulled all of their Gatwick fleet and put them back into Heathrow with the view that they'll consolidate London um, into a Heathrow market. Now, if you can consolidate London, you can consolidate the regions around the UK very, very simply. And what we need to do now is make sure that we're on the front foot as a country and as a city ready to, to ensure that we don't lose market share when that business starts to come back. And if there is going to be any consolidation, that that consolidation comes into Glasgow and doesn't go anywhere else. And so um, I think lastly for me then would be to say that the key way in which we can start to do that now is through testing. Let's get air corridors opened back up again to allow people to travel safely. Let's provide the confidence to passengers to travel. Let's provide assurance to government that it can be done safely. And let's open the economy back up again uh, to allow those aircraft to fly. And of course, it can be done. Yeah, Anton will be aware of the discussions today about double testing for students to get home at Christmas. If you can double test students to get home at Christmas, you can double test passengers coming into a country. We can do that now. We've been having conversations with governments now for seven months. We're yet no further forward, and yet there's an industry just waiting to operate. We've got suppliers, we've got test kits, we've got processes, we have modelling. Um, what we have is dithering from a government perspective that's stopping us at opening up again. And I think it's really, really key that if we don't do that now, we start to lose market share. Now, um, the one positive ray of light I believe that we have at this moment in time, and it's already been mentioned for Glasgow, is COP26. There is a real opportunity to showcase this city and to drive huge connectivity back into this city through the showcase, which is COP26. But if we don't act now and we don't inform airlines that they're welcome to operate from our city, then we'll lose that opportunity. And we have our, you know, the deals that we do with airlines are done eight months in advance. We really have to start those conversations with them now to allow them to put that schedule in place. So I think with that, I will uh, pass back to you, Stuart, but obviously happy to pick up any questions later on. Super, thanks, Derek. Um, needless to say, it's a challenging environment you've described, but nonetheless, it's worth, it's very important rather that we understand it well and can act to help uh, support protect the uh, the role of Glasgow Airport in our future. Um, our final speaker 
uh, is Keith Anderson, uh, another good friend of the chamber, chief executive of Scottish Power, um, one of Glasgow's most important companies. Uh, and in May last year, Scottish Power, uh, along with Glasgow City Council, announced a joint vision to transform Glasgow into the UK's first net zero city. Uh, and with Glasgow hosting COP26 next November, um, the city uh, has a, a genuinely distinctive role to play in uh, achieving global targets to tackle climate change. Um, Keith, um, over to you. Um, give us your insights into uh, how you see the future. Uh, in Glasgow uh, uh, in the months ahead. All right, thanks, Stuart, and, and look, and uh, a quick thanks to the chamber and also to the Royal Bank for for putting on the session uh, this evening. Um, I'll try and be as succinct as possible, so there's some time left for for, for Q and A. Um, look, there's you know, there's lo lo lots and lots going on. Um, so, you know, Scottish Power, uh, like most companies, we you know, we've um, had to change a lot because of the pandemic and because of COVID nineteen. Um, you know, we we supply you know just over five million customers uh, across the country uh, in terms of retailing gas and electricity, and about three million uh, you know in Scotland in terms of feeding wires uh, from generation stations to their to their houses and businesses. Um, uh, you know, on on day one we sent about three three and a half thousand people home uh, to work from home, um, but we also had to keep about two and a half thousand people. Uh, at their normal place of work, um, because you know if we don't keep those people at the normal place of work, it's quite simple. The lights go out, um, so we had to adapt the business incredibly quickly, um, adapt our premises very very quickly, um, and you know make sure we had all the right uh, PPE uh, and all the right equipment to keep our staff safe, because our staff, like the rest of the population, had a, a lot of a, a lot of concerns. Um, a lot of anxieties about what they could do, what they couldn't do, lots of issues about how we moved them from place to place uh, around the country, particularly under the, the first severe phases of, of lockdown. Um, so lots of change, uh, lots of chopping and change. At a, a customer end of the business, again, you know, lots of, of issues to deal with, you know, and the support we gave to around about 200, just over 200,000 customers who you know, had serious issues with bill payment and uh, finances uh, during, again, during particularly the early stages of the pandemic. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a business, we wanted to stay focused on uh, doing what we have to do, which is, you know, one, keeping the lights on, but then two, carrying on investing and growing. Uh, so during the pandemic, we, we completed uh, the construction of our biggest ever offshore wind farm. Uh, off, off the, the southeast coast of England. So our East Anglia One project, we carried on uh, with the ability to keep building that all the way through uh, the pandemic. And again, we've been building other projects uh, through this, uh, uh, through the current crisis, um, both onshore, offshore battery projects as well. Lots of work on the grid system and investment into the grid system. Um, as, a, as a company, as an industry, we're, you know, um, better off than most uh, and we've been better protected than most in terms of who we are and what we do uh, and and you know, when you when we sit and listen to and I listen to your know, pe people involved in the hospitality sector uh, the, the travel sector then you know they've um, got far bigger issues to deal with than we ever had to deal with but um, like everybody we, we we made lots and lots of changes but Kind of very early on in the in the crisis, our focus turned to how do we generate an economic recovery, uh, and how do we get investment back into the country, uh, like the government, um, you know, both at a Scottish and a UK level. Our view from very early on was, you know, this this uh, economic crisis was very different than the previous financial one, and that the way out of this economic crisis isn't. Um, through economic curtailment, it's through investment and through growth and looking at those investment and growth opportunities to drive uh, new jobs and to drive wealth and investment back through the entire economy. And that's what we've been very, very uh, focused on uh, in terms of how we can do that. Lots of discussion, obviously, about a green economic recovery. Uh, lots of focus for us about uh, infrastructure investment to deliver that green economic recovery. And again, you know, that's a, it's a great way of 
uh, boosting a recovery, uh, getting us on the track to net zero. Uh, but the, the infrastructure investment we do uh, also has the fantastic effect of, of ripple down through supply chain and a whole lot of supply chain contracts, but also a big impact in terms of jobs, because what we tend to do in those infrastructure projects is very labor intensive, and therefore it generates a lot of jobs directly for us, and again, also down through the supply chain. Um, the big focus as well around COP and the opportunity around COP to use that as a way of uh, accelerating some of those changes and accelerating some of that investment. I think Anton said it earlier, you know, the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow. Um, although the, the delay of COP was, uh, was disappointing, I think it's actually probably worked to our advantage. Uh, the recent uh, uh, results of the election in America, um, you've seen already in the last four or five days, the expectations for COP26 are going through the roof because the expectation is America comes back to the party. Uh, the expectation is that we can now move beyond Paris and the Paris Agreement and actually create a really substantial leap forward in terms of COP26 at Glasgow, uh, in terms of what everybody signs up to doing uh, and where we take the targets. That presents a great opportunity uh, for the city of Glasgow, for the whole of Scotland, for the whole of the UK, in terms of showcasing who we are, what we do. Uh, and again, we as a company in our sector uh, want to be at the forefront of that. Um, the innovation, the engineering and all of the heritage we have and what we've been doing and what we've been delivering, uh, the leadership position we've taken and an awful lot of what we're doing in terms of um, uh, renewables, in terms of offshore wind, uh, in terms of the electrification of transport and now in terms of looking at heat as well. And again, um, what, that, uh, what that can do to the economy and what it can do in terms of delivering uh, net zero, again, I think puts us in a really, really uh, good place. As a group, uh, last week, we announced that between now and 2025, we're going to invest 75 billion euros. Um, my job is to try and get as much of that to the UK as possible. I've secured 10 billion of it already for the UK from now until 2025, uh, which is nice. Uh, I would rather have 20 billion or 30 billion. Uh, the limit to that level of investment is driven by the UK's ambition, by Scotland's ambition, and by our ability to unlock projects and unlock that investment. And, and that's what becomes critical to me to the future. Um, we can talk and talk about a green recovery. We can talk about getting to net zero, but unless we unlock you know, things like planning, uh, regulatory systems, support systems, actually will just keep slowing down the investment. And I think the biggest change we need to see come through uh, the UK, and we need to do this very, very quickly, is change uh, those processes, okay? Uh, great ambition. It's fantastic to hear the Prime Minister stand up and say he wants every house in the UK to be powered by offshore wind by 2030. And believe you me, I am more than happy to go and build the wind farms. Um, the issue is getting them through the system uh, and getting, the, getting those support processes to work. An awful lot of those support processes in the UK, I think, are still working in the world of austerity and austerity economics about make things cheaper, slow things down, check all the decisions. If we want to hit those kind of ambitious levels, if we want to accelerate net zero, if we want to roll out the electrification of transport, if we want to decarbonize the entire heating system across the country, if we want to get every, power, every home powered by offshore wind, we need to unlock all of those processes. Uh, there is more than enough money out there. The size and strength of our group shows, the 75 billion shows, uh, there is a great amount of investment appetite to drive towards net zero. Um, so the appetite's there. Uh, we just need to make sure we make the opportunities because believe you me, this is a huge, big international competition. Every country in the world is looking for a green economic recovery. Every country across Europe is looking for a green economic recovery. They all see the sense of it. They all see the economic benefit of it. So we need to keep pushing. Um, um, it sounds like we've got the right ambition. We just need to make sure we've got the right processes in place to deliver it. But for us as a, as a company and in and around the city, uh, we're building our the UK's largest battery storage project at Whiteley. 
Uh, we're doing a huge amount in and around the grid system, in and around Glasgow, in and around central Scotland, driving programmes with the Scottish Government for the rollout of electric vehicle transport infrastructure. We announced our first tie up on hydrogen, uh, again, which we'll do uh, out at Whiteley at Glasgow uh, and look to drive the decarbonisation of industrial process and put Glasgow and Scotland at the forefront of developing that hydrogen economy. So huge potential there again. Um, COP26, the other great thing it does, and the other thing we need to do to make sure this is a success is about collaboration. So we are really, really, really keen to help uh, through organisations like the Chamber, get that collaboration of companies across Scotland, across Glasgow, working towards COP. Uh, we're running some sessions with WWF Scotland uh, over the coming weeks. And again, uh, the companies uh, and others more than welcome to come and join those and to, to, uh, to hook into those because we think the more we work together, the more we collaborate, the greater the successes we'll make from COP. Um, I think um, Glasgow is really, really well positioned to do it. I think, you know, we're a small enough community to make those linkages and get that collaboration uh, so that when the 30,000 delegates descend upon Glasgow, uh, as we hope they will, uh, we hope they'll see a, a city full of innovation, full of ambition, full of drive and full of determination. Uh, and that we can then use that to really springboard an economic boom uh, for the city and for the whole country. And I will, um, I'll stop there and let you hand over to questions. Thank you very much indeed, Keith. And there's, uh, gosh, there's money out there uh, that we should be grabbing. That's a, a huge incentive for us to be uh, behind everything that you're trying to do. So um, I'm conscious that um, through my particularly poor cheering, we have left ourselves with uh, just on 10 minutes for Q&A. What I was proposing to do was to extend our event by 10 minutes to allow ourselves 20 minutes for Q&A. Now, I appreciate some of the panel might not be able to do that. Um, and I appreciate some of the attendees might wish to drop out at half uh, five. So I apologize for that, but I'm hoping we can uh, at least get ourselves 20 minutes of uh, questions and answers. And um, so uh, let me start off then with a question, a general question really from uh, from Neil Amner, who was asking, um, what would you, what do the panelists think was the biggest lesson they've learned about business resilience uh, in the last eight months uh, that will have a long-term impact? What can I, who would I like, who, would, who can I start with in that? Anton, would you like to kick in on that one? Well, I've already answered uh, Neil online, but very quickly, I think for us, it was really around agility and uh, agile decision-making. If I, if I look at how we very quickly had to, you know, change an organization that was largely operating face-to-face -to, -face to online, we basically had to do two things. One is to set up uh, very different agile decision-making structures, um, both at senior and middle management level, and that really helped us to focus on the key priorities, which is how do we get teaching and assessment online? How do we secure non-COVID research and get it back on track? Um, and, and the second point, I think, was very clearly established a very clear organizational purpose around two or three key operational priorities and get very clear communications to both staff and students. And I think that made a big difference. That then allowed us three or four months into the crisis to basically know that that was secure and basically pivot back to some of our strategic plans. If we hadn't, but if we hadn't secured the, the, the two or three key operational areas, which is around teaching and assessment and non securing non-COVID research and maintaining our financial sustainability uh, through making sure that we were securing recruitment for the coming year, I don't think we would have, uh, we would have done as well, frankly. Thanks very much, uh, Anton. Can I bring in, um, actually, um, Keith, can I bring you in on that one? Sure, uh, it's similar, actually. I think agility is a good way of summing up. Uh, but you know, I'd put that more on, on, on our staff. And again, you know, it shows as, if, as, a, as a company, you've got uh, a, a strong purpose and a strong objective in life and your staff have bought into it. It's incredible how agile and how adaptable your staff are um, to literally overnight send 3,500 people home you know, with a computer and say, please, please dial in tomorrow. Uh, it takes a lot of adaptability and agility from your team, but when they're um, completely linked in with who you are, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve as a company, then it's incredible 
uh, the level of change they can go through and the support they give you as a company because they are absolutely dedicated to keeping the lights on, keeping our customers uh, serviced uh, and making sure that we're providing power, particularly to essential services. So um, it just shows you the, the strength of making sure your team understand who you are and what purpose, what purpose you serve as a company. Great stuff. Thanks, Keith. I was going to bring in both Stephen and Nicola as well to this one. So um, Nicola next. Um, mine would absolutely be the people. Um, if someone had told me um, in January that I would be laying off 60% of our staff, I, I, I just wouldn't believe them. We've never made a redundancy in almost 50 years. Um, very, very hard. Uh, and the people, the team members who were laid off, who completely understood why, um, and we we tried not to do what a lot of people could easily do, which is abuse the furlough scheme. Um, we gave people two months notice who were had been with us under two years and those who'd been with us over two years, but we knew there was not going to be work for them. We gave them three months notice. And having thank you notes from people, uh, I really didn't expect at all. Um, but the people that have remained are so committed and every time he talks about keeping the lights on that's exactly what we are trying to do particularly in the city centre hotels because what you don't need um for example off the motorway street down west nile street in glasgow is the concert hall shut the cine world shut as pizza opens and shuts every so often so we're genuinely trying to keep the lights on so that when people come to the city it doesn't look completely shut mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Nicola. Indeed, Stephen. Yeah, I think at this stage, I can't add anything more just to consolidate what everyone has said, really. I think the first thing is, um, this was a, a, a test of fire for technology generally and technology passed in the sense of this had happened even three years ago. I think it would have been very, very different. Mm. Um, so, it's, you know, it's just amazing that um, if one thing that has stood up and lasted, mm. it's that I think kind of second to repeat what Keith was saying, I think for organizations that have a clear purpose in its fullest sense, then it makes that instantaneous decision making on what you're going to do that much easier because you're not, you know, you like you have a vision, you have an understanding of what it is, yes or no. Um, so I think that's important. And then to echo again what Nicola was saying, the amazing adaptability of the people who are continuing to work through what is for all of us actually quite a kind of traumatic period. Um, you know, I mean, I've heard stats that we're all working at least an extra quarter or three months a year now, you know, that that commute time is just going back into work. Um, uh, but we're doing it because we want to do the best and the right thing, you know, by everybody. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just about um, the adaptability of um, uh, of those th those businesses that were able to adapt to new circumstances quickly and it doesn't necessarily mean the difference in the assets that they have but in the way that they use those assets um, and that is as much about you know in a sense human capital uh, and understanding who what your market is um, as much as anything else. That's great. Thanks, uh, Stephen, as well. Um, I'm going to ask a very specific question of Derek that's come in from Italia, who's asking uh, about air cargo. Has this, how much has this activity been affected by COVID? Um, does it actually help the airlines to stay alive? Um, it's been affected by COVID, and yes, it affects uh, the airlines. So airlines probably operate about 10% of their revenues through cargo. And most of the cargo that operates, particularly out of Scotland, operates on passenger serviced aircraft. So they generate part of their business model is that cargo sits in the hold is along with your suitcases and people sitting above. And obviously, because we don't have aircraft flying at this moment in time, then therefore that cargo isn't flying. Um, there has been some consolidation of a uh, cargo I think the, the loser in this is the environment um, because it's traveling by road to Europe or down to Southern England. And so therefore, all of those advances that we've made in the aviation in the last uh, 10 years or more to start to reduce some of the footprint we're losing at this moment in time. So where people see the lack of aircraft in the air as a positive 
to the environment from a cargo perspective, then most of that cargo that would be flying is now sitting on numerous lorries heading towards uh, Europe. Indeed, uh, that's a sobering thought. Um, and actually, on a on a green theme, I've got a question in from uh, Jerry. Uh, sorry, from Gary, who's asking: um, To what extent uh, have we got ourselves the right system to support Glasgow's uh, growing community of career changers who are going to be coming out of this crisis to upskill and reskill for new roles in the net zero economy? Um, some suggestion that perhaps the existing training capacity and capability and learning models maybe aren't aligned with a transition of this scale and pace. I might bring. Um, Anton in on that to start off with for obvious reasons. What's your view on that, Anton? Yeah, I, th I think it's a fair challenge actually to uh, to education providers, uh, Stuart. I, I think fortunately, I think last year the Funding Council decided quite rightly to make some of the funding that we receive as universities contingent on essentially creating more upskilling courses. So instead of you know, essentially paying simply for some full-time courses at, you know, what you might call more postgraduate um, skills base level. They say, well, look, we expect you to set up a number of these things online so that people can do them uh, for upskilling and they can do them not on a full-time basis. And, you know, actually it was amazing. This was all done pre-COVID. And even then it's amazing how quickly the courses we set up and the places we had were taken up. So to to the question, I think there is excess demand out there. I don't think supply is sufficient. So I think we need to respond to that. And we need to find, you know, especially given that we now have such great digital assets we've produced in a short period of time. And again, you know, people were crediting, um, colleagues were crediting the people in their organizations. I would absolutely credit my colleagues for doing an incredible job in converting all that knowledge and putting it in a, in a digital format. We now need to basically provide much more of that. Uh, and, and, and meet that supply. Great, thank you very much. Keith, would you like to come in on that one? Sure, look, there's a, uh, you know, there's obviously there's a, a lot of work going on at a, a Scottish government and the UK government level about job guarantee schemes or, you know, job creation schemes and, and training opportunities for all, which are, you know, and, and these things are good, they're, they're important things to look at. But, you know, one of the things we've been feeding back into uh, you know, into the Scottish government is that you, you, know, you can create a job guarantee scheme and incentivise employers to take on some additional staff or create some additional apprenticeships. But what will really drive the significant change is, is investment and understanding where's the investment coming from because that's what will really drive a significant change. So, you know, if I'm going to employ you know, 200 apprentices next year, if there's some kind of a government support scheme, that might shift the dial by 10 or 20. Um, but you know, if you looked at, for example, you know, some of the studies say that across the UK, we need to install 25 million EV charge points and 22 million heat pumps between now and 2050. Right? If you start that exercise today, that's 5,000 installations a day, every day until 2050. Right? That equates to about 100,000 jobs. Okay? So that's how you generate jobs, is make up your mind in the strategic investment uh, make up your mind on how quickly you want to go after it and, and what you set the dates for. And then you're know, quite simply, as far as I'm concerned, is let's just get the hell on with it because that will create the jobs and the training opportunities. First class, that's very clear. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, another question from Leslie. Uh, in the past, we had an enterprise allowance scheme which helped people stay off the door and get out there and create new businesses or employ themselves. Do we need a 2021 version of this to support young people? Stephen? I think that's quite an easy one. Thank you for giving me that. I think, yes, it would be an answer that was nice and easy, or at least a modern variant there, uh, thereof. I mean, this follows on perfectly from the last um, kind of question, really, um, where you get kind of the agencies to ensure that it is directed towards what we believe, to the best of our knowledge, are the jobs and the skills necessary for the future, which will be predominantly on a sustainable kind of green based jobs, not exclusively, clearly. Um, um, and so when we think about that, and it's interesting when we think about the transition to a net zero, it'd be good to get other people's views on this. Um, what we're kind of talking about is the transfer of assets, a new set of assets from an old set of assets to a new set of assets. And that needs innovation, that needs financing, and that needs installation, and that needs encouragement, and that needs advice. 
all different types of roles for all different types of people, uh, depending on what their particular skill sets and interests are. Um, uh, the only thing to add to that would be to the best of our ability to make sure that it is spread across areas, that they're not concentrated in just one or two places, um, that they are um, you know, just as much an opportunity if you're in Inverclyde or, or if you're in Paisley as if you're in the centre of Glasgow, let's say. Great. Th thanks, Stephen. Anton, I thought I might bring you in that, on that one as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I would actually agree with, uh, uh, with Stephen. Let, let me just take another angle on the question, which is, in a sense, when does policy begin to tilt away from job protection and into job creation, which is uh, uh, going to be really, really quite difficult. We know the current furlough scheme will run into March, but you know we we need to very quickly after that pivot to exactly that job creation space, and some of it I think is is around the points that, that Keith made as well. You need to also make sure that the demand pool is there, so you need to be there. You know, reassure companies that whatever schemes are being set up, they're not just going to be short term ones, so that the demand can be you know can be created for for a period of time. But uh, absolutely, I think we do need to look at ways of, 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 uh, of helping transition into work and a whole variety of schemes uh, like the one that's been suggested could work. Um, there might be others, uh, I mean, other kind of job subsidies that you could think about, particularly in those key sectors. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to take this as uh, the last question. I'm combining two questions, one from Frank uh, and one from Lorraine. Um, Lorraine's asking about the state of the city centre, um, worrying that it's become very run down since COVID um, and, and, con and concerned about uh, its future. And Frank asking various campaigns promoting the city from various public bodies uh, in the past, do the panel think that a major nationally coordinated campaign similar to the Glasgow's Miles Better in the 1980s uh, would be an important part of our um, recovery. So state of the city centre and what we need to do about that and possibly campaigns of drawing on lessons from the past. Can I, can I start with Nicola on that one? I absolutely, totally agree. That's absolutely what we need. Um, I mean, that campaign just revolutionised how people viewed Glasgow and the people of Glasgow. And, and just going back to your other question about employment, in, in my world, the customer pays the employee, not the business. So if the customers come back, I can get people back into jobs. And, and that was my number one um, objective as I laid people off and went through what, what I wanted, I four things. And the top one was the people that I'd laid off, I got them back into work. It just wasn't going to happen as quickly as I would want it to happen. But we definitely need something that puts Scotland and in particular Glasgow back on the map as somewhere for people to come and visit because there's so much to do and we, we're not shouting about it the way that we used to. Um, although we cannot rely on domestic leisure, we, we absolutely need the corporate market um, and it's great to hear when businesses like Scottish Power are, are really fighting to get investment into Scotland and the city. Great stuff. Um, Anton. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to unmute myself, uh, uh, Stuart. Uh, I, I would agree. I, I, don't, I don't think I need to elaborate. I do think some campaign which, which raises the profile and the attractiveness of the city would be helpful, particularly as we go in, you know, hopefully COP26 will help, uh, but on the back of it, I, I do think something which reinvigorates, uh, you know, the image of Glasgow, uh, you know, because we, we're going to, it's going to be a, from a halting start where we've got to reinvigorate tourism and, 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 and particularly tourism based around, around conferences as it was so active in Glasgow prior to the pandemic, we need to reinvigorate all of that. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Derek? Yeah, interestingly, we obviously look your numbers and where that looks either as a growth on a year-on-year -year basis or sometimes our industry almost we have some form of that shot will be terrorism whether it's 9-11 or attacks on the airport it'll be wind or weather um beast from the east 2010 or volcanic ash so we always check what's taking place 
I think um, when we look at our numbers just now, the passenger volume for this year is the same as 1971. More importantly, the numbers that we're looking at for next year is 1990. Now, why is that so poignant? Because in 1990, we came the European city of culture. And as a city, we came together and we changed the way people looked at this city. And I think we, we need to do that again now. I think it's a fantastic question. I think the answer is yes. Um, certainly nationally, but certainly from a city perspective, we need to get together and demonstrate that, you know, we, we started the, the, the bragging book, the narrative. Um, we need to continue that and we need to change the way people will look at Glasgow now, which takes me back to market share, takes me back to the springboard that we've got for COP26. And the beauty is we've done it before. And so we just need a concerted effort to do it now. Great stuff. I'm going to stop at that and thank all of our uh, speakers um, from uh, Malcolm, uh, Stephen, uh, Sir Anton, Nicola, uh, Derek and uh, Keith for all of their contributions this afternoon. Uh, we've heard some uh, sobering statistics around some of the key, st uh, key sectors of our city, um, sectors that have been built on past successes and building up uh, visitor uh, economy, building up the consumption economy in Glasgow, uh, and indeed repositioning Glasgow as a, as, a, as a strong city, not just of the knowledge economy or the manufacturing economy, uh, but of the experiential economy. And we have clearly got work to do to recover that ground uh, in the years ahead. Um, we are only in stage one of our conference. Uh, we will be back in the spring to ask uh, how we have got on over the winter and what what are the commitments we are now making uh, to get the city's recovery truly on pace? And of course, COP26 gives us a unique milestone, uh, oh. genuinely unique. Every, every city, uh, as Keith was saying, uh, is going to be looking to recover with a, a green economy, a green recovery, green objectives. But we are the one that has COP26 uh, having the debate uh, in our city, and it's possibly the most important debate of the decade, uh, if not uh, further into history, going on in Glasgow. So there is something to aim for uh, at the end of November. We want to come back in uh, the spring, having navigated our way through the winter, having found solutions uh, to the crisis that we're undergoing, but we want to take a much more uh, forward thinking, uh, more positive, uh, and more confident perspective on Glasgow in the spring. And um, we're looking forward to uh, having you back with us uh, as uh, attendees. Um, if you haven't had your questions answered this afternoon, I apologize for the length of time we had available for Q&A. We will pick them up and we'll get answers for you. We'll get uh, uh, some uh, interaction going uh, and answer them as best we can. In the meantime, can I thank uh, uh, again our speakers, can I thank uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland as our partner for the event and can I thank everyone for being involved uh, in this afternoon's occasion. Thank you very much, look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers, bye.